Chris. Hey, Heath. We're so knowledgeable. Are we? Yeah. Maybe on certain subjects. I wouldn't I wouldn't make that broad blanket statement though. All right. Where were you going with this? Well, okay, here's here's the thing. Heath who plays no games did however go out at IRL and compete in a bar trivia competition and placed 5th against just I wouldn't say average skill civilians because these were like people who came to the competition it is the trivia crowd you were competing against correct and i fared well for my first outing granted part of that success was to my girlfriend because she she was able to come for the win on uh the questions regarding boxing day and dua lipa the musician Boxing Day as in the day after Christmas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, December 26th. I thought it was going to be, it, like, it, and it, how it's related to, like, foxes. Oh. My synapses didn't make that connection, but hers did. Boxing Day is this enigma to me. I'm not really sure well, it's Canadian. what it's for. Yeah, but, like, what is it? Do they, they celebrate Christmas. It's like, so they get double holidays? That's no, pretty cool. Well, okay, but it's not a, it's not Christmas, too. It's more like Black Friday for them. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it the day you go and return the boxes of the presents you don't like from Christmas back to the store? <laughs> you th- you Is that think, what it's for? Nah. And if, if anything, uh, Canadian presents come in bags. Okay. That's a milk joke. I, I'm i familiar with what you're talking about, actually. How milk comes up in there, bags. comes in bags. How yeah. do you know about that? Just because I'm so knowledgeable. Oh, okay. <laughs> welcome to Mobius Tubes. Yeah, welcome to Mobius Tubes, Th- episode 35. Yeah. And what's the date today, Heath? I don't, I don't know. It's March 8th, 2020. Okay. Very good. Feeling a little sleepy after getting one fewer hour of sleep last night because the clock's changed. Uh, that I didn't know You about. were unaware of. Nah, I just slept like a baby. Well, I mean, my sleeping arrangements have been sporadic, so I'll, I'll take what I can get. Yeah, your, your life is a whirlwind, Heath. Anyway... We've got a time constraint, and we've got a, so much to talk about, so let's just dive right in on the stuff we've been playing or watching or consuming the past couple of weeks. Sound good to you, Heath? It does. So should I start or should you start? Why don't you start? Okay, mine's going to be pretty brief. That's That suits me just fine. Go for it. <laughs> I played Papers, Please again. Oh. Just for out of my own enjoyment. Now, I know very little about this game. Does it have like a set ending to it? Do you finish Papers, Please? There are endings that you can earn by just failing the objectives or doing things you're not supposed to. And then there are true... En- there, uh, There is one canon ending that I'm thinking of, oh, okay. but there are equally extensive endings you can path your way toward. I see. So this game is like a puzzle game. And for... My recent memory, I have yet to beat it in one sitting. I would always play through like half of it and then revisit it a good amount of time later. But this is my first time just just banging it out. And I even... So the, the Papers, Please is the puzzle game in which you are shuffling through documents of immigrants and making sure that everything is in order, nothing is forged, no one is trying to smuggle in contraband, and the enjoyment that you get from a hard day's work is just making sure that your family is fed and kept warm in the heat of your Soviet bloc-style apartment in the glorious Arstotskan state. Because your role in this game is a border patrol agent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're on the border... The title is in reference to you beckoning the next person to come forward with their immigration papers. Yes, got it. Oh, this is Lucas Pope's first game, correct? Nah, he no. made he made another game that was like it. Okay, but this was this the first is, one I heard. About. Yeah, this is his first like, you know how like Eminem's first album was just like a random CD, probably, and then he came out with like an actual album. Sure, yeah. Lucas Pope is Eminem. <laughs> okay. So, you've played this game quite a bit. I looked at your Steam profile, actually. I was creeping on it, and I saw your hours played was well into the double digits. Yeah. One of this game's hallmarks is 
balancing your family's well-being with the moral dilemmas of letting people into the country. Does the moral gray area decision-making ever kind of lose its luster for you? Do you stop caring about these incoming potential citizens? Well, you have, oh, potential citizens rather than your family. Right. Do you no longer care so much about their plight now that you're like 30 hours into papers, please? Right. So with the few exceptions, those that'll come up to me and say, like, please, I need to get into the country for a, a, a doctor's visit. And um, if I don't, you know, I'll, I'll perish. Now, I'll, I'll send that one away. Okay. But if, if, like, a father comes up to me and he's like, hey, this serial killer is trying to enter the country today. Let him in, but confiscate his passport and then give it to me so I can hunt him down and avenge my dead daughter. And it's what? and I'll be like, Sounds good to me, Dad. And then I'll and then the, the serial killer shows up and you know, if you don't detain him, you'll get a an infraction from the Ministry of Admissions and stuff. But no, you you take that penalty and then you high five the dad who's who and then you find in the in the newspapers the next day, like serial killer found dead and confusing happenstance i had no ideas the scenarios in this game were so outlandish like that oh yeah there's there are some yakuza level interactions between you and the immigrants whoa okay maybe i do have to check this game out well it's it's very niche you have to enjoy the uh the small utility you get out of successfully finding like oh discrepancy okay well, uh, well, we'll get into whether or not my tastes will line up with this game later because I have a niche game I've been playing that was not for me. But, okay. But we'll, we'll get to that later. What else do you have to say on this revisiting papers, please? It is super charming because of how unique it is. Lucas Pope is... He just goes from one thing to the next, right? His The following game was about like an insurance agent on a trade ship. Right. And it was complete departure. It was like a first person puzzle Logic game puzzle, still. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I want Lucas Pope cuz when did Papers Please come out? 2013. 13? Yeah. So he has ample time to create a sequel for the 10 year anniversary of Papers Please. And I was about to pitch what I would want to see in the sequel today. But I don't want to spoil it for you, so you gotta. You, if you want to hear my pitch, you're gonna have to play the game. Oh, okay. It would ruin some of the surprising elements in Papers, Please. I, yeah, I would just have to dance that line. Gotcha. And I don't want to do that unless you've okay. beaten it. Well, you have played something, Heath. I I honestly did not expect it. It was a very pleasant surprise. Uh, granted, I I don't feel that triumphant because it's not like a new thing that I'm like, hey kids, you ever play World of Horror? That's a game I've been watching. I don't know anything about that game. It's a arcadey Japanese occult Wait puzzle a game Is RPG. It in black and white. Yeah, with oh, some red. With some okay. red. Okay. And is it in like early access right uh, now? Probably. I mean, okay. yeah. And you're dealing with your reason, your sanity, kind of, and your strength and your dex. I am familiar with this game. It yeah, seems. Yeah. Not to my taste, but really cool. I was curious about it. Yeah. Okay. I'll transition into what I've been playing. Good. Two games this week. One of which, I guess this will be the final time I talk about. Into the Breach. I'm sure we'll talk about that far into the future. Hopefully. Many, many yes. times. That's what the fans are clamoring for. Yeah. This is the final time I'm talking about Red Dead Redemption 2. Because yeah. I finished the game. It's it's over. It's in the history books. But uh, the first update I have is, what is my mom's impression of Red Dead Redemption 2? Hmm. Because after hearing some of our praises for it over the, the last few episodes, she wanted to sit down and watch it for a while with me as I played. Curious. So she got a pretty solid two-hour chunk of Red Dead Redemption 2. Towards the end, mind you. This is in Chapter 6, basically. Okay. She had some interesting observations. What a, what a miserable game to backseat. You know, you ever, you have a, both of us have younger brothers. Yes, we do. And we never at any point handed the younger brother the controller that wasn't plugged in. And it was like, oh, you're doing it, little buddy, to like a single player game. Uh huh. We never, we never did that, right? You know how that's a joke that people make? 
Oh, right, right. So they're they're not really playing, but you're you're like encouraging them. Yeah, and younger brothers have all that solidarity of, oh, I can't believe my older brother gave me the single, gave me a, a controller for like Bioshock, and I thought I was playing as like the enemies. Okay. So we never did that, but right. I imagine your mom watching Red Dead Redemption Two. She's probably like, oh, that's. <laughs> You're just riding a horse. What how, what fun is that? There were some lengthy horse rides, that's for sure. I was trying to make it as palatable as possible by going directly from story mission to story mission. So it was more or less like watching, kind of like watching a TV show, as I touched on last episode. You made an effort to make it as cinematic as possible. Yes. Okay. Um, I, During those, those horse rides, did you hit down on the D-pad so it went into the camera? I did not use cinematic mode. No, okay. didn't think to do that. That might have. Uh, that's what my first thought would have been. That that would have been a good idea. Just a couple of her observations that I would have never, I could have never guessed what she would have think about this. But something that impressed her every time I rode through a bush or foliage that knocked her socks off. She's like, she, "Wow, the rustling." The yeah, the rustling. The I guess the lack of collision boxes on bushes was like pretty <laughs> impressive. How, because, like the bushes do like bend around your body kind of they do which most games probably don't do to that extent of realism so her tangential experience of video games her expectation was that you would you would touch the the polygon of that bush and then just go boof, boof, and just <laughs> on, on your way i i suppose that is the case yeah <laughs> observation number 2 i i approached there's these two prisoner guys, Mr. Black and Mr. White. I, yeah. I was hanging out with them, and she was disgusted by how their beards looked. She said facial hair in this game is super ugly. Like wiry? Um, she just thought it looked ridiculous. She was glad I kept a clean shave in Arthur. <laughs> um, I, uh, that's so... I have to take a look now. I guess, you know, hair is difficult to render in games. It's one of the least... Oh yeah, and it clips everywhere. And it clips everywhere. It's the so, least it's the lowest priority is what you're saying. For someone to say, who's right? not used to looking at in-game human AI NPC models, we're used to looking at hair in video games. She was not. She thought it looked pretty dumb. Oh. Wait, quick. Everyone recommend the games with the best hair. Uh Last of Us? Probably pretty good. Maybe some Detroit becomes Detroit's human? got some uh, I can't even think of anyone with facial hair in Detroit. In The Witcher, you can oh, turn Hank, on. Of course, sorry. In The Witcher, you can turn on Nvidia Hairworks, which adds like it tanks your game's performance. Oh yeah, but Geralt's hair will swing around very realistically. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, her last impressions were during some cutscenes or gameplay scenarios. She was unclear if I was controlling like all the characters in the Vanderlyn gang, or if I was like making them all fight and do stuff, which would be a monumental task. But no, I had to explain. I was just Arthur Morgan. I don't and, understand. During the cutscenes? Yeah, she... Oh, she, so if an if somebody threw like a Molotov. Right. She was yeah. like, oh, did you press B? Yeah, yeah. And she, you had to be like, no, but that'd be cool. Right, right. Oh. So that was an interesting observation. And then there was one cutscene where... This army soldier told Arthur Morgan he was going to bring him a glass of water. And that, that allows for a scene where Arthur gets to do some, like, eavesdropping. And then the soldier comes back, sands water. And that <laughs> really irked her. She's, she thought that was very rude, that there was no water delivered oh to Arthur. Um, so Thank I, goodness the head writer at Rockstar stepped, stepped down. down the, the brother of the co-founder. <laughs> the, the, after following this scathing review from your mother. No, about... But by the end, she said, I can understand why you like this so much. That oh, was okay. her final takeaway. Mm, why? She thought it was interesting, and the the character interactions and dialogue were better than she thought they were going to be. Okay. Okay. So that was my mom's take on Red Dead Redemption 2. I finished the game. Who, ca who cares about your take? Uh, yeah, quick, yeah. Quick. It's irrelevant. Call up your grandma. Yeah, that, that'll be the real hot take. Yeah. And she'll be like, ah, oh, these uh, the ricochet mechanics are really selling it for me. 
it, and all told, it took me 74 hours to finish. And I'll admit, going into it, I had some nagging doubts if this was going to be able to live up to my memory of Red Dead Redemption 1. Just because it was eight years ago I played Red Dead 1. It was one of the first open world games I played. That novelty factor was pretty big for me. Yeah, so is our current adoration for Red Dead 1 pure nostalgia or is it still like an amazing i am unsure about that question because i look to red dead one and be like that was so fun and i've watched like cutscenes and stuff and been like oh i that was so fun i agree but if i put my hands on it am i gonna be like oh this is whack that is i am the I ultimate am question actually afraid to find out the answer to yeah, that yeah, question yeah. don't touch it so i'm not gonna touch red dead one although finishing this game really makes me want to go back to doesn't red it dead yeah one. But yeah, so in the eight years since I played the first game, I've played so many more open world games. The novelty of that gimmick has worn off. Also, Rockstar's last offering that I played, GTA V, did like nothing for me. Just the the tone of that game and the kind of situations and scenarios it puts you in, not my cup of tea. So maybe I thought, maybe Rockstar, they're just not my jam anymore. But all that said... Red Dead Redemption 2 is among my favorite games. I It did capture all the hype, all the excitement I had for it. I'm super glad I played it. Arthur Morgan. I like John Marston a lot. I think I prefer Arthur Morgan as a protagonist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is very high praise. I, I think he's in my upper la- echelon of favorite video game protagonists. Maybe even top five. He's up there with like Commander Shepard and Geralt of Rivia as my personal faves. Love that guy. I, I'm just really, really pleased. The kind with the of game. guy you would want to see in like a Red Dead 3. Yes. He had such a good character arc to him. Mm-hmm. Real, genuine change by the end. God forbid. Oh, Chris. Oh, we just we just ruined the character. How so? I just I just Red Dead 3 is going to be a prequel of Arthur Morgan. <laughs> they just keep going further back in They're time. They're going to keep going back. <laughs> the the game series that is released in reverse chronological order. Yeah. It just keeps going back. Yeah. Red Dead 10 is going to be on the Mayflower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So th- those are kind of my spoiler free impressions of Red Dead Redemption 2 at the end. Would you like to take this moment to transition into spoiler territory? Let's do that. We we got to talk spoilers because I've been I've been, you know, you've been sitting on them for a while now. Yeah, we didn't even say Guarma by name. Yeah. All right, so we're we're going into full spoilers now. Everything is on the table for Red Dead Redemption 2. Mm-hmm. Oh man. Abigail is is a bitch. <laughs> Abigail She's was... She's so t- uh, difficult to work with, and John is being so noble. So we're talking about the epilogue here? Well, I mean, you and know... She didn't start to bother me until the epilogue. Okay, yeah. Because... she, Yeah, insufferable. Okay. In the epilogue, you play as John Marston. I actually had it spoiled for me that Arthur Morgan was going to die. I mean, you could... I mean, as soon as... Oh, okay, quick, let's... And then we'll backpedal like an hour... You know, it's like four hours... Remember, what mission is it where he arrives in San Denis yeah. and, then, <laughs> and then and then he collapses and right. it's first person. Yeah. And you're like, is this the end of the game? <laughs> yeah. Tell um, me, tell me that caught me by complete surprise. Yeah, I was not fully surprised because I also had it spoiled for me that Arthur Morgan gets sick at some point. But you, but it was like a gameplay interrupting, right? The Batman the, Arkham Asylum glitch fest. The way it was style. brought about did surprise me. Yeah, you fall off your horse. This guy comes up to you. Are you okay? And it's all first person. It's he escorts you to the doctor. Baffling. Uh, big surp- Yeah, the way they presented that was very surprising. I liked it a lot. I was at the time. I don't know. You know how Arthur contracts tuberculosis, right? From the Downs family. Family, yeah, Mister Downs, guy. who you like rough up for a debt repayment. You catch his tuberculosis, which later kills him as well. Yeah, you. I've I've gone back and watched that cutscene in particular and been like, wow, that's that's all it took. It's 
the ultimate karma. Harrowing. At the time, I didn't make that connection until... Nah. Now you totally forget about it. I thought maybe it was... This is chapter six where that happens. I thought you maybe contracted it in like that hot, humid environment of Guarma. Of Guarma, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or something like that. It kind of throws you off. Right. But no, you were, yeah, you were in the ice cold water and then you end up on a, a super hot island and you think, oh, maybe because they don't have vaccinations. Right. The whole Downs family arc surprised me. It was way better than it was gonna. It was supposed to be. Yeah, and talk about tragic. You you just keep running into Mrs. Downs all across the entire state of Lemoyne and she's New selling Hanover, herself. And she's been forced into prostitution because you, well, her her husband died. You took all their money. The as son a is a minor. The son is a minor until who's, you're like, get out of here. He's getting picked on by all the other miners. Yo, remember when you go to rescue the son? And Arthur Morgan's like, leave him alone. <laughs> I'm, I'm so weak. And the uh, the big boy miner is like, ha, old man, you you can't fend for yourself. And it's like, oh, but that's me. Yeah. Uh, but, and then you fist fight him, right? Probably. Yeah, you do. You you beat him up as best you can. But it's like, oh, I'm the protagonist. I'm supposed to be the biggest, strongest. Right. At, in contrast to most video games, as you approach the late game, Arthur is at his weakest. Yeah, state. and you're and I'm so used to just flexing on him. Right. Yeah. Their power fantasy. This is not. This is the decline of Arthur Morgan as you get into the late game. So sad. But the Downs family. The Downs family. Yeah, and they're they keep asking Arthur why he's trying to help, and they really kind of don't want his help. They want to like keep their pride. Mm-hmm. And he's always like, I don't even know why I'm doing this, but he's so adamant about Arthur trying Morgan to. Is. Yeah, Arthur Morgan is so adamant about trying to make, trying to right a wrong that he can't really fix anymore. Yeah, it's touching stuff. Perfect. Yeah. In fact, I think all of the debt collection missions you do for Hare Strauss are highlights for me. I think you can see it continuously wear on Arthur as you go along that doing this kind of work is not. This is not morally Immoral. acceptable. Yeah. And then it culminates with him running uh, Herr Strauss out of the camp by the end. Leopold Strauss. Yeah, yeah. Kicking him out. He's just so fed up with ruining so many people's lives. Like the one African-American family who he finds like fishing down by a river and the guy... He's trying to collect the debt from this man. And he says, okay, let me go. Yeah, I was about to mention it. So it's in like... It's in not Louisiana. Like yeah. the swamps above San Denis. And the dad... I didn't even know he was Native American. I don't think he was in my... Uh, I, I think he was African American. Uh, yeah, I, I don't... I, I didn't think he was in mine. Oh, But okay. yeah, isn't, isn't like you, you totally... I was trying to sneak up on him because uh, oh. I could sp- spot him on my radar. But then they're like... Oh, well, and, and the father is like, don't be upset, son. This is how it's got to get done. And yeah. Then, and then you you t- hog tie him onto your horse, right? Oh. Don't you? Don't you? Continue with your story. This is maybe not what I'm thinking of. I feel like you put him on your horse, and then you start riding to the jail in San Denis, and then he, like, hops off of it, or some of his ah. goons come to for the assist? I know exactly what you're talking about Is that now. a different one? This is different from what I was thinking oh, okay, of. Okay, 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 this okay. is a good one as well. Yeah. There's so many good ones. Yeah. Okay, keep going. Yeah. he's very. The dad is very accommodating when you kidnap him and take him in. And then he tries to... He jumps off your horse. Psych! But he's still like hogtied, so he doesn't go anywhere. Well, he does escape. He starts running, but you're on horseback, so you have no problem running him down. Yeah, but doesn't he do it twice? Or like... I only remember it happening once for okay. me. Okay. But yeah, it was just really funny because, of course, like, oh, just get off. Right. What I was thinking about the dad, he's, he's very accommodating when you say, all right, it's time to pay up on your debt. He's going to the house. His son is in the house. He's like, why are you doing this, dad? He's like, all right, son, it's the way it's got to be. And he goes under the kitchen sink to collect the quote unquote debt. Quickly whips out a gun, uh-huh. tries to kill you. You end up murdering him in cold blood, leaving the son an orphan. And then you loot the house. It's not a pretty situation. Yeah. Did you ever... So there's some really cool strangers in this game. Did you ever meet Marco Dravik? Is he the Tesla man? He is the analog for Nikolai Tesla. Yeah, I did his whole thing. You did his whole thing? I think so. You meet him in St. Denis. He's got like a remote-controlled boat, and he's trying to attract investors. And then you find him up in this remote... His laboratory far to the north during a rainstorm... And he's trying to make a robot, like an artificial intelligence. He, he, through Frankenstein. Through Frankenstein lightning strikes. Yeah. Um, 
did you ever so you do that mission it's it's fun the robot like takes two steps and then topples over and he's so ha- he's, he's elated like my son by, by that progress yeah do you ever go back to visit him there's no there's no his mission marker never pops up again no bubble for you to but if you go back you find his dead corpse and his robot has murdered him and escaped wow and you find this his notebook you can loot once he's dead. Yeah. And it details his five year plan from like attracting investors, make first model, make these like improvements. And, and by st- year five, he was planning world domination. Yeah. Huh. What an eccentric character. Yeah. He was cool. I think I was John Marston by that point. Did you ever try to tie loose ends as John from Arthur's previous quest lines? Yeah. Let's talk about that because in the epilogue, you are playing as John Marston. Much like how in the first game, at the end, you transition to John's son. Jack. Jack. This game, you transition from Arthur to John. Which This game, to a greater extent. Because as soon as you're John, you don't have your tuberculosis nerfs. Right. You also don't have, oh man, the final missions in chapter six. My beautiful white Arabian horse gets gunned down. Your horse gets killed like canonically in the final mission, and it's just gone. Oh. So my max bonding fastest horse in the game, <laughs> I no longer have it for the for the rest for the epilogue and any free roaming I do. It's yeah. gone. Yeah, that was a big loss. I've got John's horse Rachel, and she just does not compare. Nah. <laughs> so that was sad. Okay, you were saying, have I tried tying up loose ends in the epilogue as John? Yeah, because I don't think I finished all of that hunters things oh the the guy missing a leg yeah or or that girl up in the north who doesn't know a thing about survival oh i i liked her yeah Um, i did finish her up with arthur did you try tying up loose ends nah i think i i I packed it up at that point i i had my everything pretty much tied up with arthur except mr black and mr white the escape prisoners i went back to the city of Rhodes as john and I saw their question, their stranger mark come up on the map, and I tried to do their mission, and it actually started me over from the beginning. I had to like go mm. back into town and take down their wanted posters as John, which I had already done as Arthur. That was very annoying. I don't know if that's the case for everything else, or if that was just like a one-off thing. Upon finishing the game, I went back to listen to our old coverage of it, and you talked about the Abernathy pig farm. Yeah. And those two inbred brother sister lovers who tried to rob you Mm -hmm. yeah i went back i did that as john and that just hammered home for me the fact that every side activity they re-recorded with john's dialogue yeah john has like as john is also recorded as if he is the protagonist of this game like every scenario arthur could have done they had to re-record for John. That's no okay. You can't say that because, th- like, like the actual story missions, right? Main story missions excluded. Side activities, though, they couldn't be sure if you what you did as Arthur or not. Right. That is a staggering amount of work. Wow. Yeah. That's why it took super long. <laughs> Hundred hour work weeks. Did you ever camp out in? Oh, I don't even know what the place was called, but like Murphy territory. Yes, and I then, did. And then they just they come out of your periphery, and it's like you shouldn't be here. And then it's like, wow. Yeah, and then I didn't learn my lesson. Did it? You did it again. The following time that happens. Ag- and then they they have like a up? whole gang of them ambush you, and you have to like gun them down. Super cool. I never tried it the second time. You, yeah, you you learned your lesson. Yeah. I kind of forgot. So the epilogue, you know, you're down. Build that house. Building that. I love the epilogue. Me too. People, Donkey hated it. Okay. I guess it probably depends on how much you're attached to John Marston. Because this is really just. Yeah, like sufficiently. S- spending time with John and the family. That yeah. is the epilogue. An uncle. Oh, God. Hate it's uncle. a beautiful tree. I like Uncle. Ah, I mean, he's so lazy. He didn't deserve to get roasted over a fire by the, the Skinner gang. Nah, probably not. <laughs> It's it's a beautiful transition into the first game. It sets up the events of that. When you are down in Blackwater for the first time, how are you feeling? <gasps> Ooh, like PTSD. PTSD? Yeah, because it's like, oh, this represents the end of John Marston. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. I was like, ooh. uh." And Beecher's Hope, and Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, that barn we're building. Um, Anyway. Yeah, Remorse. Okay, that was not my experience at all. That's not where I was going with this. Was it Disneyland to you? No, it was like full-on nostalgia trip to see these environments I haven't seen in eight years be reconstructed. And the first thing I did, there was no story mission to do this. I just took a long horse ride to see how far you could go. Oh, yeah, yeah, Like past McFarland's Ranch, past Armadillo, down into Tumbleweed. And it was like, wow, the map of Red Dead Redemption 1 is also in this game. Mm -hmm. And they don't even use it for the story. Which led me to believe, like, or not believe, but just kind of this thought experiment where games very seldom do they ever... In following installments, do they ever take you back to the same location you've been before? Yeah. I think that's like an underutilized gimmick or um, mechanic. Mm, Pokemon. Do you go to the same places all the time? I think in Gold and Silver, you can go back to Pallet Town. Or like Kanto is there. The, the, okay. The OG region. Gotcha. For me, at least, this was such a novelty to revisit a place you have history with, mm-hmm. but like reimagined in and higher graphical fidelity. The only other example I could think of is like how the Yakuza games are all set in the same city over like from the 80s up through the early 2000s. So you see it change over time. Okay, cool. That's pretty cool. And I really liked that they, it was super nostalgic for me to just ride through Armadillo, even though there's a huge plague going on in Armadillo, so they don't have to like populate it with NPCs and stuff. <laughs> That's so lame. I guess it makes sense, though, because like Armadillos themselves are plagued with disease, right? Are they? Leprosy. I, uh, like the animal. Uh, yeah, like I think the majority of Armadillos have leprosy. This is news to me. I'm I, so knowledgeable, everybody. Yeah, I guess so. Was that on Trivia Night? It was not. Okay. All right, yeah. Any more thoughts about Red Dead Redemption 2? Um, Dutch shooting Micah. Kind of like, oh, it needed to happen, but it don't make that much sense. That whole final scene didn't make too much sense. Nope. So At the top of Mount Everest, Dutch, just the, the face turn that he has. Yeah, Dutch. And then it's like, oh, but you're the main antagonist for the first game. Wah. And then like... Dutch and Guarma, how he just strangles that Spanish <laughs> lady at the bottom of the ladder. Yeah. And it's like, wow, you're enjoying it too. I get the you, it, Dutch's, Dutch's arc is not an arc, it's like an upside down triangle where it's just like good, good, bad. I, I really opinion. like the philosophical discussion that goes on between certain members of the gang where some of them are of the opinion. So Dutch has this downward spiral. Some think all the the bad events that have befallen them, this has brought out, this has really changed Dutch and made him a worse man. Mm -hmm. Well, some think this just brought out his true nature. And I liked the debate that raged between like John and Arthur around that. Mm -hmm. And you liked how like Pearson, the cook, laughed and like the priest laugh. Yeah, people Reverend are, Swanson. People are are take, making their exit, and it's like, oh, this is the sign of the yeah, the the West is dying. Yeah, everyone's leaving. This way of life is no longer sustainable. Yeah, yeah, super cool. It was super cool. Damn, what a good game. Mm-hmm. Red Dead Three. We'll see it in it's a twenty twenty six. Yeah, give uh, or yeah. take. Mm-hmm. I don't know where they go from here. Like I said, they're going to do... Young Arthur gonna do, Morgan? Yeah, they're going to do When He Meets Dutch. And it's going to be like the most drawn out story. It's it, There is no prequel they cannot do. Yeah. <laughs> because you're going to get to like Dutch's mentor and then, <laughs> then go keep going back. It's literally like the curious case of Benjamin Button, the game. It would be interesting because, like, you Franchise. find Arthur keeps some newspaper clip- clippings by his bed, and one is like, "Oh, this Vanderlyn gang robbed some folks, and then spent the rest of the evening handing out money to the poor in this one town." <laughs> so I don't know, maybe a game where you see like the more benevolent side of the Vanderlyn gang before the very gradual, nuanced de- descent into savagery. Mm-hmm. That would be cool. Um, but what we actually want. Is probably not another 
Red Dead. We probably not. No, that's the we've we've done it. I feel like they've they've told the story and they told it very thoroughly. Yeah, you got to go someplace else. Some some other thing. How? All right. Did you you know Samurai. Arthur Arthur Morgan had a son, right? Uh, uh, is that you? Do you gather that from it's like ah, oh, John? You could have been, you know, you remind me of my son. This was a very offhanded comment. You know, remember uh, Rain's Fall, the Native American chief? Yeah. You go on a ride up on a mountain with him. This is like an optional mission. Yeah, you get a flower and to get flower for medicine. And, then, and right. he's like, "You can talk to me, Arthur, but I understand if you want to ride in silence." And there's some dialogue prompts you can do. And one of them comes up and it says, Arthur's son. And I was all over that option. And Arthur confides in the man how he met this girl, this like bartender when she was 19, had a child with her, would visit her routinely, really liked the, the son. And then they got murdered in a robbery over like $10. Oh. And that really changed Arthur. Uh-huh. And I was like, wow, what a revelation that is totally missable. I, I have never even pictured him as a father. I had no idea. This is like 60 hours into the game. Yeah. That really stood out to me. Yeah. And like kind of how, don't you have like a fishing mission with Jack? Yes, you do. Yeah. Yeah. All um, right. So we close the books on the Red Dead Redemption saga. Oh, no multiplayer from this? I, I did Red Dead Online. I did the intro mission, but I don't think I need to do any more. It was fine. I mean, going from Arthur Morgan and John Marston to a silent protagonist is very jarring. Yeah. I don't like it. I get that. Great. Great. Okay. I actually played one other game, but I can keep this pretty brief. I'm, I'm almost done with it. I don't know whether to call it this old classic that slipped me by or a brand new release because it's kind of both. Were you talking about Doom again? No. Heath, how do you, when there's a trail, do you call it a route or a route? Route. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to use route for the rest of the episode. I've been playing Kentucky you, Route Zero. Have you heard of this game? I have. Okay. Episodic point and click adventure. The first episode came out way back in 2013. Just a five-part series finally wrapped up in January of 2020. So I, it's been sitting in my Steam library for a while. Now is the time to jump in, I thought, because it's, it's a complete product. I can check it out. This game is super bizarre. The whole thing is this surreal, dream logic story about this antique delivery man trying to deliver one final antique. Just on, he's like a trucker. And it's on this road called Dogwood Drive. And seemingly, no one really knows how to get there. Except. This is modern day? This is seemingly, it's set 80s. in like the early 2010s. So pretty oh, yeah. contemporary. There's definitely this overarching feeling of like economic recession and economic hardship. That's the late uh, early. Aughts. Yeah. So following the Great Recession, that's kind of where this game is, what this game is steeped in. And it's it's dealing with his drive down Kentucky route, route caught myself, zero. You say which, rough as well. As rough? In, as in the top of a house? I say roof. Oh, do you? Who says rough? Not I thought me. you did. Definitely not. <laughs> I don't, I've never even heard that. Okay. Um, there's this route zero that is this like fantasy highway where it's seemingly this kind of like open secret where people know about route zero but they're, they're like afraid to go on it because it's like super weird on it and it's even hard to find this game oh. it's a point and click adventure there's not really any puzzles in it it's mostly just dialogue choices and following directions people give you on the highway um actually yeah like they'll say oh uh drive past a tree and then take a left and you do that. And okay. they're super easy, but it's just kind of a, a a funny gameplay mechanic. The dialogue choices are, they're a little branching. I don't think they affect the overall narrative too much. What's kind of cool is you can fill in your main character, whose name is Conway. You can fill in his backstory kind of as you see fit. For example, at one point, this is a very offhand comment, they'll ask you about your brother. 
And you can like talk about how he's a successful banker, and that kind of makes that true. Or you can say, oh, oh he's a dropout. He's a this dropout where he kind of lost touch, and then that makes that true going forward for future dialogue. Uh-huh. So that's kind of interesting how you can like write his narrative as you see fit. That's very like Stanley Bearable, yeah. Your interpretation of the character is kind of the one you get to go with. What else did I want to say about this game? So I said the game kind of, it operates under this dream logic. The conversations will seemingly not make any sense. And it's also kind of like a dream because it puts me to sleep. Um, <laughs> you call Disco Elysium a very literary game. And I would say this is true of Kentucky Route Zero as well. It is a lot of reading. And maybe literary isn't the most accurate word I could say. It's kind of like a play, actually. From every different environment you enter, it'll say like, oh, this is act two, scene five you're entering. Very well. Oh, always much preface so. it with that. Between the different five acts of the game, there are essentially these intermission chapters, which they call interludes. And one of them is actually, you're literally a person sitting in a play and you watch a play. Um, wow. And I think... Yeah, you can like swivel your head around. This is first person. The, that play is first person. The actual acts of the game are point and click, like oh, two D, two D, like a diorama, diorama kind of thing. Yeah, I got you. Graphically, it's very like minimalistic, mm-hmm. which very sharp edges. And actually, you can go into the options menu and you can make it either pixelated or smooth, which is cool. Mm-hmm. It gives it a different feel. Yeah, the whole game has this weird tone to it where, like, even in the options menu, instead of, like, doing accept or cancel when you make a change, it'll say, do you want to remember or forget? Oh, cool. Or instead of, like, when you pick the font size, instead of it being small, medium, large, it'll say, like, bug, cat, human, or mammoth size. (laughs) So it's got some Uh, weird sensibilities to it. That's like Into the Woods. Night in the Woods. Oh, my God. I did it again. Every time. <laughs> that said, I do find it kind of boring. It's a fairly short game, so I'm the sunk cost fallacy gets me. I'm in the middle of Act 4. I'm going to power through to the end. Mm-hmm. There are the moments in the game that really redeem it for me. I'm thinking about a certain musical number that happens. Where the whole thing, it kind of like it transcends the game for me, becomes kind of like an almost an out of body experience where I'm just full of goosebumps. Uh And it wows me. (laughs) Once in a while, that will happen, which is high praise. It's just a matter of uh, digging through the rough to find these diamonds. Okay. And I, I realize I'm the outlier here because a lot of the talk I've heard about this game has been very positive. It got great reviews on Metacritic. I should have picked it up on my fantasy publisher video game docket. Oh, this because was, it got great reviews. It was a, a candidate for the draft. Yeah, it could have been. I I suppose. So yeah, I'm gonna finish it. It's not my favorite. I don't necessarily recommend it unless you like very ethereal, almost At- fantasy like adventures where. From scene to scene, there's almost like very little continuity. continuity. Yeah. Exactly. It's like a skit from skit to skit, and there's very little tying them, them together. There is a perfect litmus test to tell if you will like this game. All right. This is so perfect. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to talk about the concept of one of the interludes. I'm not going to spoil the content of it, just like the premise of it. Mm-hmm. One of the intermission chapters, all that's in front of you is a telephone. And there is a piece of paper on the side with a phone number on it. The only thing, the only really choice you have is to dial that number and see what happens. Yeah. And you get on the phone with the Bureau of Secret Tourism. Okay. And it's, you know, instead of like, oh, uh, press one for English, press two for Spanish. You're, like, there's like a robo voice telling you that. Yeah. It's kind of like that, except all of the options are. Super ridiculous, super funny, and you can you can just interact with that for a while. It's kind of like a, a branching decision tree yeah, with uh, some cleverly written dialogue. So that's well and good. I just thought this, this idea just came to me out of the blue. I felt like this could be the type of game that would go to this length. 
where if I actually dial that number on my real physical phone, Uh something might happen. (laughs) So I did it. It rings. Someone picks up. It's telling me I have an area code I'm calling to Kentucky. And it's the same Bureau of Secret Tourism guy talking to me on my real phone. So you can do the entire intermission on your phone. I'll give you the number. So if anyone wants to figure out if they like the style of this game, call this number on your phone and see if this appeals to you. Uh, You can call 270-301-5797 and get on the phone with the Bureau of Secret Tourism. They'll tell you all about the Echo River. My mouth is was a gape as soon as you said that it was an actual Kentucky area code. The attention to detail is very commendable. A the extra mile, no pun intended cuz you're going to be on a route. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. Perfect. Let's end it there. End it there. That's Kentucky Route 0, a very weird well, game. And now now that you mentioned the title and its context, I think I would just I would go really fast and be like Kentucky Route 0, but but I would say if you're in Pokemon, it's like Route One, Route Sixty Six. Just to just to be uh, amend my pronunciation at the beginning of this. Oh, gotcha. We all right, did it. that's all we've been playing the yep. past few weeks. So when we get back, we'll have some sweet news for you. Uh, see you then. Hey Chris. Hey Heath. So, so Halo's on Steam. Yes, the Halo Master Chief Collection. Yep. You sound pretty down about this. No, nah, I mean it's on my wish list, but it I have no I have no uh, arbiter in this fight. <laughs> so December, they released Halo Reach for the first time on PC, and you're probably bringing it up now because Halo Combat Evolved, the original Halo game was just added to the Master Chief Collection for the PC. Is that why you, you're talking about this? Yes. Yeah. Because so, I read that headline and saw that like the collection has all of them. Halos 2, 3, 4, and ODST are forthcoming for the PC. Nah, 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 nah. If you boot up Halo Ma- the Master Chief Collection on PC, you see the menu options to play them, but they're all grayed out. Oh. You, they're actually. What makes this more confusing is that it's fully available for purchase. You can in the forty, fifty, yeah, forty dollar version on PC. Yeah. You can buy it. It says it comes with all of them. Those but other four games are out. not out yet. Oh, that's so weird. Oh, that's so weird. It's actually a little misleading. Are you, yeah. Are you for certain? Um. Yeah, because the prices next to two, three, ODST, four, they're all NA. Oh. And the only ones actually available for purchase are Reach and Combat Evolved Anniversary. And and I but I want to play three first. <laughs> uh why would you play the end of the original trilogy first? Oh, uh, because I thought it was the best. If all right. I'm a person who's played all these games. You start with ODST. <laughs> no. You you start with either Combat of All. Yeah, you start with the OG and work your way up. Uh-huh. Okay. That could be a fun thing for us to do sometime in our immense free time. Yeah. I mean, it's on my wish list. Wait, immense free time. How long is this going to take me? Oh, they're it's actually like, It's like 15 hours each. Yeah, but I mean, based on the amount of time you've had to play games in general lately, <laughs> it could take months. All right. All right. So that was that. Uh, yeah, kind of weird how they advertise that it's the bundle of all of them when only two of them are available. I got bamboozled until you told me. I also I also want to apologize to Thomas from last week. Oh, uh, the creator of of Flappy Blocks because right. he you know he included that in his in his question. And then last episode took so long to do because I was in between uh, projects for work. I delayed us a little bit as well, so it's not fully your fault. I know, but I feel like his game is out or, so, or you know, like the sequel is already in development because of how long I took. So I just wanted to apologize to Thomas uh, 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 and, and hopefully Flappy Blocks is doing him well. Right. I hope he had eggs in other baskets for his advertising campaign. Yeah, more more podcasts to reach out to. 
All right. Let's get on with the Sonic movie. You are, this has been an ongoing drama for you, or for like a year. And we're, it's finally out. The Sonic movie is in theaters. We, we share in the credit for it being the highest grossing video game film. We of all share time. in the credit? Yeah, because we reported on how bad the original design was, and that afforded them the opportunity of delaying it and redoing the design. And that ultimately led to its its highly unanticipated success. And granted, neither of us are going to see it, <laughs> but uh, it's apparently like a fine children's movie that they have set up for sequels. With I see. Eggman is going to look more like Eggman. Okay. Like the portly glasses mustachioed antagonist. Yeah. And they're probably going to introduce the other Sonic characters. I'm not talking Shadow, but if Shadow is in the sequel, I might see it. Remember how Shadow the Hedgehog taught me swear words? I don't remember that. No. <laughs> what did he say? Like, damn? It was for the GameCube. Yeah. And like his his death quote, if he fell off the mat, would be like, oh, or damn <laughs> and then it'd be like Eggman I'm gonna send you straight to hell and then I'd like dart around the room to see if my parents were here <laughs> if this was back in like 2006 okay uh, so very formative years from Shadow the Hedgehog remember how I, I it's it's got branching paths so you can either side with the good military or side with the bad demon eye we're talking about the Shadow game? Yeah, 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 we okay. are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean... <laughs> I thought we're, we're gonna... talking about the movie. No, we, who cares about the Sonic movie? So, you can either... you can. It's, it's just a funnel. And from the very first mission, you can either go good, neutral, or bad. And then if you go neutral, you get there. And, and it's, a, it's like five missions until you get to the final boss of each pathway. I couldn't comprehend the morality d- objectives as a young child... So I beat this game on neutral like f- like four times over the course of like a year. And then I, it was like another year. <laughs> and then I, I booted it up again and it was like, oh, these empty boxes that go above and below the neutral room oh. are other missions. So I probably played a third of that game f- four for, th- times. for years. That's hilarious. Unbeknownst to me. So, you know, Shadow the Hedgehog. Wow, what a it's it served its purpose to a much greater extent than the developers have ever anticipated uh in my own development. And let's let's look forward to his appearance in the uh, anticipated Sonic sequel. Uh, and maybe someone's Which anticipating is, it, but not me. It's so weird to say. Well, the execs are because it made them money Here, on the dollar. Let's circle back to the movie for one moment. Yeah. Do you so it's the highest grossing video game movie. Yeah, Detective Pikachu is rolling in his poke grave. Yeah. So what do you say, I guess, is that a backhanded compliment or not? Like, is this, by just general movie standards, was this financially su- successful? Or are video game movies generally duds? No, it was successful. Okay. Video game movies are not duds by comparison. In terms of money. I'd say in terms of quality, they're probably <laughs> usually duds. Yeah. Because from what I've heard, this this movie is a fairly inoffensive, by mediocre, book, fairly forgettable, buddy comedy by the book travel movie. Yeah. And uh, to have that be the highest grossing video game movie is not exactly high praise. No, it's a feather in no one's cap. Right. But I guess, I guess the the. The long-standing tradition of having atrocious video game movies has been broken. We now get bland ones. Yes, we we now get vanilla, I- innocuous, two-hour jamborees. Did you hear there's an Uncharted movie coming out? Yes. And Tom Holland is playing Nathan Drake. A, a young Nathan Drake. Okay. I like it. It sounds interesting. I just... My expectations are I think it could surpass the Sonic movie in terms of quality, but it's not going to be great. Why do I say that? Just because 
The Uncharted series is pretty novel in the video game space because of its heavy Indiana Jones inspiration. But if you take an Uncharted game and convert it back into a movie, it'll just seem like knockoff Indiana Jones. Are you going to end up with Indiana Jones, Crystal Skull, Shia LaBeouf uh, (laughs) levels? Tom Holland is not Shia LaBeouf. No. No. Uh, He's which not is, an actual cannibal. Which is good. Yeah. <laughs> cannibal. <laughs> that song's great. So I think Tom's got the chops for it, but they can't treat him like an adult. Or can they? Yeah, it's I didn't I wouldn't have pictured him as a Nathan Drake. I don't it will be weird to see a young Nathan Drake. Because Nathan Drake, Drake's not he's plucky. Yeah, he is. But in an adult way. In an adult way, yeah. Yeah. Not like a wet under the ears Spider Man kind of way. Right, right, right. Yeah. Also, just the fact that the Uncharted games, they're like these fun 10 to 12 hour adventures. Yeah. When you condense that down into a two hour movie, I just feel like it, it'll struggle to be anything more than just a, like a highlight reel. Just a Mission Impossible Ghost Recon. Yeah. Yeah. But quickly transitioning into a video game to tv adaptation i'm much more talking about last of us hbo also by naughty dog yeah the last of us is getting an hbo series yeah how crazy is that and wait wait the the piece de la resistance the the cherry on top let me let me find the article did they get ellen page to play ellie for those of you who don't know The Last of Us and Beyond Two Souls both feature young female protagonists. Uh, One played by Ellen Page, who plays, uh, oh, in Beyond Two, I don't even remember the name. And then in Last of Us, the character Ellie is played by another actress who looks just like Ellen Page. Yes, it's very uncanny. Yes, so... You can make you can draw your own conclusions, but the casting for this HBO special or this series will be something to something to a closer examine. I don't think they have Ellen Page on it yeah, yet. Unlikely. Maybe they do. But the cherry on top I wanted to bring up is this Last of Us adaption being made by HBO is being led by Craig Mazin, the creator of HBO series Chernobyl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was fan? That was a fantastic yeah. miniseries. Expect some body horror. Uh, Very similar in tone to what I would want from guys. a Last of Us TV show. He has a quote that he said, "Getting a chance to adapt this breathtaking work of art has been a dream of mine for years." So seemingly he's familiar with the game and he's a fan of it. So yeah. he is okay. So we can. Oh, dude! I want some bottles and bricks. <laughs> yeah. A scene, there will be at least two bricks thrown in this TV <laughs> show. There's, there have got to be. Otherwise, it is woefully unfaithful to the uh, source material. Yeah. But, yeah, that I just feel like TV is a more natural fit just because of the added length. Like, a, a TV season is about the same length as The Last of Us in terms of hours. Sure. So you don't have to make it a highlight reel like I'm afraid the Uncharted movie will be. Right. So, yeah. For the first time I can think of, I'm actually no. I was looking forward to the Witcher series, <laughs> so now I'm looking forward. You're to still a, looking forward to the uh, season two. Yeah, although I guess those are technically not even adapting the games; they're adapting the books. Yeah. So, kind of a gray area. But I'm excited for the Last of Us HBO TV series. All right, got some good stuff in the pipeline. Yeah, great stuff. So that was all of our news, or did you have more news? Uh, that was all my news. And all exciting stuff. I liked it. Um, when we come back, why not? Let's let's do an episode of Mobius Tunes, Volume Five. Da 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 da. Yeah. People have been wanting it, and we're gonna deliver. What's the What's the score so far? I think you've won once. Okay, and you've won four times. Three times. Three times. Yeah. Yeah, I so think I, that's the score. Now is my chance to close the gap. Now is your chance to close the gap. All right. I. I think you'll like the music I've selected. All right. I will see you after this break.
For those of you unfamiliar with Moby's Tunes, the rules are as follows. Chris and I have selected five games, uh, songs. From games. Songs from games of varying difficulty and uh, notoriety. And it is up to our opponent to identify the game from which the song is played. And to assist each other, we have hints carefully uh, constructed to help them uh, solve the thing. The highest scoring uh, points you can have is 15. Uh, I think I got 10 points at one point. Impressive. No, no one's gotten hot greater than 10, right? I feel like there might, might have, been have been an 11. 11 at one point. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's tough. It is tough. So uh, I think uh, I will start in the guessing chair. Okay. Don't, because that's. So Heath will be guessing the five songs I've selected. Yeah. I put a theme on them this time. I don't mind telling you it. The songs for this this volume of Mobius Tunes. Because wait, here. So, so themes we've done in the past. Yeah. Where alternating strings and heavy metal. Yeah. <laughs> all Mario in the title. Yeah. All non found on a Nintendo console. Right. And then uh, any other themes? Uh, usually my theme is just songs I like. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. this time my theme is music from indie games. Ah, okay. All right. So that's a bit of a hint for you. That should, that I should fare well, I think. So without further ado, Heath will try to guess my easiest song choice for the round. Let's get it started. All right, here's song number one from Chris. <laughs> Indie game, yes. At one time. At one time, but has since become just like a monster. Can you call dungeons and story mode indie games at this point? Because they're so manufactured. We're talking about Minecraft, folks. A full three points for Heath. Yeah. Right, yeah. Because now Minecraft is owned by a little company called Microsoft. So not exactly indie, but at one point, Mojang and Notch, back in 2009 or so, were the underdog rookies. The making. humblest of beginnings for how meteoric they've gotten. Exactly. And now there's a whole generation of kids who immediately know what this song it's means. their yeah and it is so relaxing oh yeah who who made it again this is called c sharp isn't it what's the song Ooh, called? It's something like that or is it sweden it's not mm. you're, you're like very i think what you're saying is very close yeah anyway good job heath i did it so three Killing points it. on the board, off to a strong start. Hopefully you can maintain your momentum. Mm -hmm. All right, number two, coming at you. You know I, I love this song. Okay. And it's particularly... Okay, so... Heath's video game remix boys include Silva Gunner, Triple Q, who did crazy remixes for the Sonic games and stuff. And then Botanic Sage, who his hallmark is putting Space Jam's Come On and Slam and Welcome to the Jam on top of video game songs. So I know this as like Shovel Knight, what's it called? Shout of Earth or something? Or it's like Strike, the, strike earth the Earth. Or something? But I know it as like Slam the Earth because uh, it's, oh, the, it's remix. the, you know, Welcome to the Space Jam. Yeah, so uh, it's totally bastardized Yacht <laughs> Club's uh, now classic song. I love this song. It's great. Yeah, the whole Shovel Knight soundtrack is amazing. What? I wish I liked those games more than I do. Oh, I get. Yeah. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Cause because platforming. I, I, there are a few games I want to like as much as Shovel Knight, and I just I'm not. I'm not a platforming guy, so... Nah, I mean, Hollow Knight is, is ah, enjoyable. Yes, yeah, somehow that clicked for me. Because of the combat and stuff. Right. But, like, the... the I, I don't care for the art style of Shovel Knight, either. Okay, I, I kind of dig it. Yeah. It's no Hollow Knight, but I still like the look of Shovel Knight. Yeah. And, yeah, the music is so good. I am just cleaning up, Chris. You... I anticipated you'd, you'd do pretty pretty well. You were very generous this time around. Well, they get harder. Don't worry. They okay. get harder. <laughs> Here we go. 
before I, I play song number three, Chris, I just wanted to know, did you have like fun hints uh, for the, um, those first two songs? I am fairly unprepared, actually. Uh, I did not make, in anticipation of you getting them, I did not have hints for those. Okay. Because you know I love the hints, and, and in retrospect, I want the, the fans to know, like, oh, would I have gotten it if I had got one hint? Right. Yeah, that, that would make it more fun for the people at home. All right. I'm at six points. Yeah, commendable. About to be nine when I ace this next one. Song number three. I've absolutely played this game before. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. We just talked about Lucas Pope this episode. Oh no. Chris, I am just w- swabbing the poop deck when it <laughs> comes to Return of the Old Berdins OST. It this is, is here, I can guess the context of this song. It's when you uh is it is it the music that plays after you get three uh no, it's not the jingle that's after you get three confirmed identities. It's um Oh, it happens during one of the memories. This is in a particularly the, not lethal memory. This is a very like cheery song, right? Yeah. But it is also the theme music. Listen, the 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 uh, the screen just dissolved into the center. Right, it did. <laughs> this song plays during the chapter called "Soldiers of the Sea." When you go into those memories, mm-hmm. which is a surprisingly dark and brutal chapter, actually, oh. not at all meshing with like the cheery bells that are on display in the music. Yeah, but. We we getting sliced by mermaids at this point, right? Not that one. Okay. Um, Spoiler. Yeah. yeah so it's we. Re- this song now has a very dark connotation for me in my head, but I really like the music. Same though. Yeah, it's 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 a lot more cheery than oh when the kraken's coming down. It's just like dum, yeah. Dum, dum, dum. I I. I Oberdin, man. I did not expect to like the music in Oberdin so much. It's yeah. It's 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 is papers please musical or n- no? It has one theme that's like the menu theme, and then some of the endings have their own little jingles, but it's not nearly. Uh, there's no soundtrack to it, I, and I'll go into what I want the soundtrack to be for the for my sequel, my fantasy sequel. Okay, but you got to play the game first. So Heath is at nine points. Here is where my song difficulty spikes. Psh, you think you thought? <laughs> Here we go. Here it comes, real real quick. Real quick. Here it comes. Song number four. I'm at nine points. I'm about to get a, a 12. Ah. Uh, Heath's confidence is evaporating in front damn. of my eyes. Well, no, because this is just like... It could be anything. Yeah, not quite as distinct. Well, hopefully this part... Oh. Okay. I mean, I'm trying to think. Okay, so let's talk about indie music. The instrumentation can be like the 8 bit Shovel Knight style. Yes. And the Minecraft style. It could also be like an orchestral something or other. And then there's also, we got like the way you describe it. For like those chiptune ones are also called like sound fonts. Okay. Like you would a typeface. Yeah. So this is like that harmonica kind of thing that was going on. Ought to be like a fun giveaway. But this is just this could be any old You walk into a room. You know I'm you know I'm about to say it. Just here, let me dramatic effect night in the woods holy cow did i get it you got it yeah i'm so good dude i'm so wow good holy yeah cow. yeah what what gave yeah, that away this is like a ca- you're in the cashier's office maybe oh or, my god like supermarket any kind of oh walking my down gosh. the street yo I was- I was going to make you look foolish and give hints like, oh, we mentioned this game on this very episode. <laughs> and, oh, this the second hint was probably going to be... Constantly ruining the title. Yeah. Yeah, you constantly butcher the title. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Eat it, Chris. You're at 12 points. Bah. Bah. All right. There is no chance, no chance you get my final song. Yo, bet money 0%. on it. 
everyone in the chat screaming. You're gonna. You're not. There's no way you sweep. sweep. Absolutely no chance. Yo. Hold hold your applause for this last song. The final song. Imagine if from that first note, I just I just shot it out. I would lose it. Hmm. Huh. Very XCOM, but that's not an indie game, is it? I don't think so. No, it's made by Firaxis. Firaxis, yeah. All right, well, I'm waiting for this intro to be over. Yeah, it's coming. But that's the... Uh-huh. Oh, boy. You know I'm... You know, I'm trying to not say res again. Remember, do you ever look into that res game for the Dreamcast? I haven't watched gameplay, but, no, but I've listened heard... to the soundtrack. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of like... This sounds like the pacer of the future. <laughs> it kind of does, I guess. Or just like every boy's garage band. Oh, boy. Oh gosh, don't it's it's not Hotline Miami, hopefully. Uh I don't think so. I think a Hotline Miami would have been more corrupted. Oh sh oh Whoa mm. Oh I s my did I speak too soon? Nah, but this is also kinda like Crypt of the Necro Dancer, like metronome. But Heath, I I've already brought Crypt of the Necro Dancer music. Yeah. Would I double down? No, no, you'd never do that. I'm not trying to sweep because this is the hardest song, and I've I've gotten this far. I'm just gonna say Hotline Miami. An excellent guess, but an incorrect one. I'm yeah, afraid. That's fair. Your first hint is that this is a obviously an action game, but it's actually a, a boss action rush game. game. <sighs> so for the kids at home, boss rush means that the gameplay is not centered around fighting grunt level enemies, working your way toward the big boy. It's just constantly, like Devil May Cry isn't a boss rush. Right, you have regular Even though there enemies. is ample boss fights in that yeah, game. Yeah, this is just a series of boss battles in this game. Huh, you know, uh, well, that's what's like the quintessential boss battle game, everybody? Shout it at the same time. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> not many come to mind, actually. No, not even Bayonetta. Like, I think of Shadow of the Colossus, but there's no way oh. this... And that's song. not an indie game either. No, that's not an indie game. Oh, and I wanted to say, like, Enter the Gungeon has bosses, but it, there's also not a boss rush. Crap. I mean, that's a fine hint. I, just, I, I ought to ignore it, though, and try to focus on, like, sci-fi indie games that I know. Sayonara Wild Hearts. Hey, that's not too bad. Um, no, that's not correct, I'm no. afraid. All right. You're going to you're going to like this final hint, I think. Right, will I? The title for this game is Mimics, a what, is, is a synonym for anger. Rage. No. But uh but Rage is like is like a uh, a mainstream developer. That's by the same that's like Ubisoft. Uh Rage is published by Bethesda. Yeah, or excuse me. Yeah, Bethesda. So that's <laughs> Yikes. Uh, good thing I didn't say final answer, right, Chris? Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, a synonym for anger. All right. Let's just rattle off uh, fury. Um, yeah. Let's just say fury. Yeah. You are correct. Nice. You got it. I thought so. It's. Do you know the game No, fury? what does this look like? All right. It came out in 2016. It's very uh, stylized. You're like a cyber ninja, and you go from boss battle to boss battle. There's this weird rabbit guy talking to you. Uh, it's Fury with an I, not Fury with a Y, by the way. Oh! Oh, the graphics look bad. Uh, they're definitely not going to wow you. Yeah, but, they're, but they're like blocky, cell shaded poor... It is it's, the definitely graphics aren't, cell shaded The design is the issue, not the uh, graphics. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is a game... I know exactly. I've seen this game. Okay. 
I played yeah, through the like first two ninja. bosses or so. It was some really tight controls. Uh-huh. I, you've got like a cool dodge, yeah. and there's like bullet hell elements going on, but it was too hard for me. I dropped it, but the music stuck with me. Oh. All right. All right, so, thir- so a final 13. score of 13 points. That has to be the highest score anyone's ever I gotten. I think so. Well, well done, Heath. The night in the woods blew me away. I can't believe you got that. It was just fresh on the mind uh, <laughs> from, from this episode, yeah. Uh, and it was just so innocuous. Yeah, that was, you know, we, you, I, I significantly lucky. I've never touched that game. Right. And I only watched it briefly. We, that was shot in the dark. You read me shot like a book. Night. Yeah. Off the cuff, I'm looking at my songs for you, and I am predicting you will get <laughs> seven points. Oof. Okay. This is, uh, yeah, I, I definitely... Because, okay, Chris, when we first came up with this game I, uh, as an idea, what were the songs that I immediately thought of? Baba Yet 2 from Civ 4. Right. Rogue Warriors credits sequence with all the <laughs> swearing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, some, some Undertales and stuff. So we are. I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel, even though I am the video game music guy. Okay. So this is still songs that uh, you like are good to know. And and you know they they're, uh, the difficulty is appropriate, but it's definitely not the Christmas gift that you bestowed upon me. So <laughs> so I I issue that uh, condolence, Chris. The challenge is to uh, get fourteen points, which is a near impossibility. But okay. here's here's the first song. Oh. This is the DK rap. Yes, it is. Um, Very good. But it's from Donkey Kong 64, correct? It is. That is the game. Yes. My hint was going to be, uh, what? Like, this is the introductory theme to the 1999 Nintendo 64 game. (laughs) And if you couldn't get that, I would be like, the song is called DK rap. Gotcha. So you got it. I got it. Yeah. Well done. So I am still on track. Victory could be a possibility. What age group knows that song? It's not us. We're too young for that. So it's like Probably. people in their 30s now? That seems From about 1999, right. 1999, Yeah, late, right? late 20s. Yeah. Are they, are, they, are they singing the DK Donkey Kong? All right. Song number two coming at you. Oh man, I I should know this. Yeah, if I ever uh, if I ever go to the Olympics, yeah. or if I'm ever like a pro wrestler and I need like an intro song to walk out on, sure. Because did you? Oh, that's a good transition. Kenny Omega is a pro wrestler. Not in the WWE, in like a other one. He came out to Megalovania as Sans. What? During a Halloween special. And it was like, oh my God, Fortnite's taken up Undertale, wrestling's taken up Undertale, and Toby Fox collaborated with this wrestler to come up with like a, a unique animation to put on the Jumbotron of like the heart in the box and whatever. F- featuring this wrestler and it was like totally amazing to come out to megalovania this would be the song that i would come out <laughs> to well it's very triumphant it's definitely a retro game i've definitely heard this song it, i'm picturing a fighting game for it i'm gonna say it's street fighter 2 oh <gasps> he got it Woo! he got it yes that's it's hyper Street Fighter Two. Uh, There's so many versions of Street Fighter yeah. Two. Street Fighter Two Turbo, Street Fighter Anniversary Edition. This is Guile's theme. Guile, okay. yes, yeah. Guile is like the flat top blonde America. He was yeah. played by Jean Claude Van Damme in the movie. How much money did that movie make? Uh, Not as much as the Sonic movie, that, apparently. That was probably a flop. Yeah, that's right. 
Well done, Chris. You're at six points. All right. You're doing as well as yeah. I did. Are you sweating here? You have no... This next song, you should probably get. Oh, okay. Here you go, Chris. You're at six points. You got to keep it going. Keep it alive. <laughs> I love this battle theme. If yeah. you say ultimate, you're wrong. No, no, no. This is this is clearly. Ooh, you almost got me. I almost put a four on the end. This is Persona Three. Yes, it is. This is mass destruction. Right. I've mentioned this song before as the because I couldn't think of the name. Because like only the the rapper says it. Gotcha. Uh, I just know it as the one where it's like live, 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 live from the beginning. This is the uh, ooh yeah. Da 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 da. Oh, okay, yeah, you know from the the, the chorus. Yeah. I never I never got that far. I only got to like the beginning. Okay. Uh, that's Wait, how you know almost, it. Almost, yeah. This is the chorus, right? Great. Heck, thanks for including a Persona song. Jeez. So, yeah, my hints were going to be this song can be heard on Smash Bros. Ultimate. Oh, okay. And then th my second hint was going to be the guitar you hear right now is a dead giveaway in my opinion. Why would that be? Because it's the same, like, it's not a game. Uh, like. Oh, okay. That same guitar rhythm. is ubiquitous in Persona songs. Really? As someone who's played through two Persona games, I did not pick up on that. No, that that guitar just then. No, oh, dude. Oh, I'll yeah, I'll play it for you side by side, but it's so obvious. Yeah. All right, you were at nine points. Unheard of. I doubted you. I you thought you'd be at me. seven. All right. I, I know my DK rap. <laughs> you do. <laughs> if he shoots ya, it's gonna hurt. Because <laughs> his coconut gun Insightful anyway. lyrics in that one Yeah Prepare to lose though Because uh, these next ones are, are I said the same thing Okay Yeah yeah you did Oh this is great This is absolute Perfect podcasting Best of luck Oh I like it so far Uno dos tres cuatro But you're right. Uh, nothing is coming to mind right away. Is it? Is it more of this, or is that little thing in the way? No, this something? is. You're going to. It's more the same. Okay. There are no. There are no. The beat's gonna change, but it no dip, makes no difference to you. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. It's getting more lively, but. My guess is just drying up in the wind. Okay. I think this game is... <laughs> Cloudy with a chance of meatballs. The game? The game. <laughs> I'm not familiar with that. Are you? <laughs> uh, no, I'm not. Unfortunately, that's the guess. Chris, no, it's not that. Damn it. Whatever that may be. Your first hint... This is my second favorite game in which you play as a spaceman. Oh. I know. Weird hint, right? That is a weird hint. But I want to know what, what your first favorite game is where you play as a spaceman. Oh, you can probably just think about it. Oh, okay. Outer Wilds. Yeah. All right. So what other space games does Heath like? He does not play Halo, so that's out. He never played Mass Effect. This does not sound like Mass Effect, so that's out. Are you sure? This isn't like the Reavers theme? <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't I don't remember this song appearing. Space games. But space games he likes. Okay, when I say I, now hold on. The, the hint man. was this is my second favorite game in which you play as a space fan. Okay. So maybe you're not even in space, but you're just a retired astronaut. Who can say? Um, this is the first. Okay, so here's another thing, right? So okay. I never played Donkey Kong 64. 
never played Street Fighter 2. Sure. Never played Persona 3. I have played this game. Okay, that makes sense why it would be a favorite then. How about Super Mario Galaxy? You're referencing how he visits, of the, he is of a planetary nature. Yes. And yeah, in his in his exploration of the galaxy. Correct. Uh, incorrect. Ah. Uh, I've never done a Mario Galaxy. Su- no, that's not true. I did. You did Honey Hive yeah, Galaxy. Yeah, you did Honey Hive. That was the one time. So I've already done that game. Uh, incorrect, Chris. Your second hint is that this game shares a title with the sequel of a 1999 Pixar film. Oh. It's, the, it's the sequel of a 1999 Pixar film. Okay. So I was right with Cloudy with the Chance of Meatballs that this is a movie tie-in you game. Were, you were closer than you thought. But, okay. Animated film as well. Which year did you say? 1999. It's the first first movie that they made. Okay. So this okay, game okay. shares a title this is with the, the sequel yeah, yeah, to yeah. That, that. This is Toy Story 2. Correct. This the song game. is called Bombs Away, in which you fight a model airplane in Andy's backyard. As Buzz Lightyear? Who because is a, a spaceman. spaceman. There okay. you go. It all came together. All right. You were at an even 10. Yes, an even 10. So I, if I... If you per- ace it... I tie you. You tie me. This is... Uh, glorious in my opinion uh we will we will see uh have have fun with this chris okay ooh very energized ooh yeah i'm i'm thinking this very funky. As they mentioned, yeah. Yes, yeah, they mentioned. It's got the word funky in the title. It's the title of the song? Of the song, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm not going to, yeah. no. Funky the, Fresh Beats. The game beats. does not have is the word the, funky. The song is called Funky Fresh Beats? Or? No, it's called uh, Ain't Nothing Like a Funky Beat. Okay. Uh, I don't think I'm S ranking this one, Keith. All right, this game is Let's Dance. <laughs> you know, Let's Dance. Remember when uh, we went to that birthday party and we all the kids <laughs> gathered around to play Let's Dance? That's that's the Ubisoft game, right? Do you mean Just Dance? Just Dance, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no! This is Just Dance, yeah. Uh. <laughs> that's what I meant. Yeah, uh, it is not Just Dance. Just Dance is... I. With few exceptions, I think it's all pop songs that are are playable in that game. Oh, okay. Um, Dang. So, what about its spinoff, Let's Dance? No, no, that's oh, the funky version, right? That's the funky version. <laughs> Very good guess, Chris. Actually, the first hint is that this is an indie fighting game in which you hit a ball back and forth until one player remains. Oh snap! Oh god, I know the game. I've played it. There's like a guy, one of the With fighters has like head. a smiley face. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know it. It's not Gang Beasts. That was the other game I played That's that day. That's the other game with like, uh, yeah. Because oh. if you get hit with the baseball, you take damage. Right. Which is ricocheting around the screen. Yes. The, the faster the ball gets, the more you score. And oh, th- when you are the last person to hit the ball, you are immune to it. It's ah. only your opponent who would then die if struck. Yes, I, I can picture the game. The title though is more elusive. Uh, yeah, uh, I take the L on the second guess. Give me another hint. Here is your final hint for this game, and you'll 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 enjoy. Much in the way that on uh, Rogue Warrior, I gave you those like pseudonym yeah. titles. And Get I ready. gave you a synonym for anger today. So. Yeah, we are we are tapping into that vein. A parody title <laughs> for this game could be Fatal Federation Inferno. 
Fatal Federation Inferno. <laughs> oh, this is like the ultimate mind bender. Yeah! Oh. Okay, I want to say it's like Lethal League. But there's another word. Fatal Federation Inferno. I thought it was just Lethal League, but then there's a word with like fire at the end. Is that correct? Is the title three words then? Yes. Okay. I only know the game is Lethal League. Uh, we'll give it to you. It's Lethal League Blaze. Blaze. Really? Is Look it, it up. Look it up. Oh. That's the game. Lethal League Blaze is the sequel to Lethal League. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, okay. I think this song is, does not make an appearance on the it, first one. Got it. I didn't know there was a sequel. Cool. So this this song is uh, composed by Hideki Nakamuma, who is most well known for composing Jet Set Radio. Interesting. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And your favorite Jet Set Radio song... Yeah, I don't know. It's such a, a niche genre right so that's where so i think i ended with 10 and two thirds no, you, you of you got point. 11 points 10 and two thirds of a point i oh. got two out of three words in the <laughs> no, title we'll give it to you all right to your very respectable 13 wow i did not anticipate you getting night <clears throat> in the woods <clears throat> round one best case Flexing scenario you would have said something like in the woods and i'd say eh, not quite <laughs> All right, congratulations, Heath. You have brought our uh, records more closely into alignment. You have won twice. I have won thrice. So that's where we stand. No idea what songs are going to come the next time around. I've already got my next lineup for Damn. you. Damn. All right, well. Maybe I should get the title of the video game music guy. No, that's still me. Okay. I, I intend on keeping that. So, that was a very fun episode of Mobius Tubes. I liked it a lot. Oh, yeah, we're yeah we're closing up? Yeah, we're, we're closing up. All right. No emails this week, but we'd sure like to get some next week. So you or your friends could write to us at the email address, MobiusTubesPodcast at gmail.com. That's MobiusTubesPodcast at gmail.com. We, we make the promise here that we are guaranteed to read your email on the air. That's a bold claim, but so far we've stuck to it. Even if it's like your grocery list, we'll still read it. <laughs> yeah, we, we're just dying for the content because 2020, no games have come out. Although that's changing very soon. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The delay delay gate has caused us problems, so we we are in need of of some feedback. Um, also, listening to the last episode, episode 34, just because it took so long to get out, uh, the listening to the coronavirus segment. We were very calm about it back then, but seemingly it's gotten a lot worse. Well, it's also maybe part of the reason I wanted to play Papers, Please is because in one of the missions, you have to turn away uh, Infected. Uh, people from uh, the United Federation okay. uh, because of an outbreak there. And in fact, at the, the, one of the very – because, okay, in Papers, Please, right, you start with just a passport. And it, if it's expired, you got to kick them away if, like – the, the document number is forged, then you detain them and stuff like that. And then, because of the politics going on, you add an entry ticket and then an entry permit. And in work, uh, people who are coming on a work visa need a worker's permit. And then people are seeking asylum have their own thing. And then diplomats have their own thing. And the, one of the last things in the game that is added is their polio vaccination chart. And oh. you got to make sure that that's within three years of, of expiry. Uh, and then, like the names could be different, and it's it's extensive. Native citizens of Arstotska have a, an ID card, and you got to double check that their weight is the same because if they weigh di different, they could be carrying some some contraband on their person. You got to search them. Whoa, yeah. So so coronavirus is very similar to what happens in in the later half of Papers Please, and that might be also why I, I wanted to dig in. There were many unforeseen connections in this episode of Mobius Tubes that just kind of appeared. Miraculously, yeah. Yeah, very spooky. That's what you get.
That's what you get. Give us some five stars, people. Yeah, give us give us a nice review. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Tell your mom. Maybe she'll listen to the <laughs> to the mom impressions. And she'll segment. have like weird criticisms that we never would have thought of. Yeah, a whole new perspective. Yeah. So that was a lot of fun. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Heath. I'll catch you on the next episode. All right. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. Hey there, Heath. Hey, Chris. Didn't see you there. Nah, because I'm under all these packing peanuts. Listen to how they rustle. <laughs> Did you enjoy the sound effects of of last episode? Did you put them in? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you might uh, you might have just scrubbed for like the timestamps. So. I yeah, I didn't catch them. It was footsteps. I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I'll have to go t- go back to that and take a listen. Sure. Um, but yeah, those packag- packaging peanuts sure are, <laughs> are appealing, audible. Yeah. and it, they're definitely in a cardboard box, which we are about to be inside <laughs> as we take a stroll to the cardboard corner. Yes, so this is our this is our secret Fight Club style uh, bo- tabletop game uh, expose. Right, because we we like tabletop games. We want to talk about them, but we don't want to go through the effort of making an entirely separate podcast. Oh, God forbid. That's 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 why uh, RSS feed stands for... Uh, r- r- uh, <laughs> I was going to say, like, single stream only. I don't know. Readily serviceable stream. Oh, yeah. We tried. Uh, yeah, so we have this short segment at the end every week where we talk about a board game we think has some merit and might be worth checking out, depending on our recommendation to you. Last few episodes, we we brought you the wonderful world of Cosmic Encounters and the uh, uh, dystopian life of a spy in the Resistance. Uh, and now we're going to do some farming. Yeah, or- amongst other things. Mm-hmm. This is the heaviest game we've talked about in terms of like, like rules complexity. Oh, I thought you were going to say like uh, box weight. It is also the heaviest box weight. Don't you think? Because yeah. of all those pieces? Right. So the game we're talking about this week is Scythe. 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 Yeah. However you want to say it. It's the farming tool that looks like a, a reaper's yeah. sickle thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This game came out in 2016 through Kickstarter, I believe, uh, is a... Alternate history post World War One Eastern European theater agricultural slash industrial economic game. That yes. was a lot of descriptors. It was. So just picture all the arms racy type stuff that happened resulting from World War One, you know, like how like Gatling guns were things and like Mauser Gas masks. Yeah, and like Mauser pistols had like where you know it's like uh semi-automatic was was being developed or or whatever right yeah and and just take that to the nth degree in which there's uh mechs yes in the world of scythe tanks have evolved into mechanized walking fortresses that dominate the landscape and you get to use those because this is a technically a post-war game, although the, the tension of conflict remains, conflict is not at the center of Scythe. It is primarily an economic efficiency game. And you use these big mechs basically for moving your, your farmers and your workers around the board so that they can uh, produce resources for you. Because they're not going to cross that river on their own. Am I right, Chris? Right. This game has weird river crossing rules in it. <laughs> Um, What's the goal? How do you win? Yeah, the goal of the game is to have the most money at the end. But money... No, no, it's not, right? Uh, oh, well, it is. It, it is. is. Yeah, it's <laughs> an economic know. game. What am I doing in this quarter? Um, but money comes from various sources. You can get money from just like having coins, which is the game's currency. Mm-hmm. Or... Uh, all, all right, the scoring system in this game is one of its more innovative mechanics, I think, where... Should we, are we getting too nitty gritty here, right here, away? Here. So, Chris, if I okay, so there's upgrades I can make, right, that allow me to move more people or uh, harvest from more uh, tiles. 
Yeah. Should we explain what this game looks like on the board? So the board itself is very painterly. It is very pretty. The production uh, quality in this game is high. Yes. And uh, the the mechs themselves are not super big Japanese robot punch fist Optimus Primes. Right. They're they're like MacGyvered farming equipment. Yeah. That just happened. They they. That they weaponized. They look very cobbled together. Yeah. Um, especially like the there are different nation factions in this game. The Rusviet faction, who is a stand-in for Russia, theirs look especially agricultural to me. They've got like big claws on the front, which I, I guess would be for chopping down wheat or something. Yeah. But these are plastic miniatures you get to move around on the board. The board itself is a big series of hexagons that you will... Everyone's, everyone who picks a nation that they are for the game, and it gives you certain asymmetrical powers for the game because not every nation is the same. Uh, Poland or Polania will play very different from the Saxony Empire, who was kind of like Germany. Um, you all start in the corner of the board, and you will be expanding your influence, uh, progressing, moving your workers around so that they can produce on different types of resources because there's mountains and forests and towns, and they all give you a different kind of uh, resource m- resource material. Yeah. Uh, you then feed into your economy to do things like produce structures and buildings or make more mechs because more mechs means you can move more people around more quickly or uh, increase your infrastructure uh, can we talk about the upgrading system in this game yeah so that's what i was saying yeah, is, okay. is like you know i'm so if i want to make my engine more efficient and re- produce more across and, and move more guys i'm going to uh i'm going to do so and by by spending like my oil resources that's the one in particular and i get money from it every time i do it yeah and, and like we said, the person that has the most money at the game wins. Right. And on your turn in a game of Scythe, you pick from one to four different actions, each of which lets you do a different thing. But this upgrade action that you can do by spending your oil, it'll make all of your individual actions more efficient and more lucrative for you going forward. So it has this cool ramping up feeling to it where by the end of the game, a single turn could be a lot more beneficial to you than at the beginning of the game, which is a little bit slow. I will say. So I think the best way to describe this game is in the form of like Xbox achievements. Okay. <laughs> just for our listenership. You know how if you if you beat a certain objective or, or get all the collectibles, you get a, an achievement worth like gamer score or in the case of PlayStation, like platinum trophies or something like that. Yeah. If you unlock all of the mechs in this game, you earn a star. And if you unlock all the upgrades in this game, you earn a star. And right. if you beat somebody in combat, you earn a star. Yeah. The person who first gets six stars triggers the end of the game in which you're like, all right, count up all your money, and then and then we'll see who wins. Yeah. If you basically excel in one little sub area of the game to the nth degree where you do everything there is to do, you basically unlock that achievement, which is a star. And doing six of those brings about the end of the game, as you just said. That's the ticking clock. And that's the ticking clock. And where this game is fun is its variability in which you're like, mm, I don't know if I want to go for like the aggressive or the expansionist or the industrial kind of play style. Ooh, I'm going to happen across this random event. And uh, it'll be like, oh, you know, some, some children uh, ha- are trying to get a cat out of a tree. You can either get the cat out of the tree and collect like four food or like chop the tree down with your mech and and uh you you'd like lose popularity because maybe they like that tree but you'd get four wood and then you could just like leave the cat in there uh and 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 just like maybe lose popularity but get uh just as a beneficial uh, uh, a resource and it's just whatever play style you kind of want to go with yeah the random event deck is pretty cool in this game. How it always gives you three options to choose from, and they have like cool flavor text, and they always have a nice illustration accompanying them. Um, now, folks, yeah, you may be thinking, "Huh, this is a very unique, interesting setting. 
that sounds very high quality and uh, uh, is in depth and and complex enough for my friend group to want to do. We we can't recommend this to the beginners. No, this is definitely a step up, even above Cosmic Encounter. Correct. This is for the the hardcores in the audience. Right. I would say this is a pretty. If if we put this in medium complexity, it is at the far end of heavy on medium complexity. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I I really like that. Here's one complaint I hear people say because this game it looks like a big. You've got these big mechs dominating this kind of map of the board and people carving out their own sections of territory. It looks like a, com- a, a combative dudes on a map area control type game, but it's really not. I'd say it's a hybrid. I'd say 75% of the game is kind of an isolated, I'm just making my resources and consuming them and trying to be as efficient as possible. But with this constant threat of conflict because your neighbors are going to be creeping ever closer to you. And a lot of the time it's actually not super beneficial to just attack someone outright because this game has a popularity mechanic where if you beat up too many other people's workers, your popularity plummets and suddenly a lot of your points become less valuable to you. Things like controlling more territory will reward you with fewer points at the end of the game. If you are a less popular nation. Right. So while combat can be lucrative in stealing resources from someone or earning you one of those achievement stars, you have to do it sparingly. Because if you become a warmonger, your popularity will plummet to zero and you'll find yourself cashing in very few points at the end. And that isolation in the beginning with the looming threat of conflict might be cool to some or boring to others. Yes, it could. It, I guess it depends on your expectations going in. The game looks a lot more thrilling than it always is. It's a, it's a different type of fun, I would say, than it maybe presents itself as. It's not as aggressive as Blood Rage or Innis. Right. For um, those of you, who, the, for the, the initiated. How do you feel about the asymmetry and different factions you can play as i like it i like how russia starts with one of their workers on a village because the russians i think have a huge population and uh ought to be the ones that can crank those out earlier in the game sure yeah kind of thematic and i like how germany has immediate access to mountains to produce steel for their mechs because they're more aggressive and their river walking mechanics follow suit Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Asymmetry is cool. I like the asymmetry a lot. I think it adds to the game's replayability because, oh, playing one game as Poland, it gives you a very different experience as playing as Germany or Crimea. And some of them are a little more complex than others, but they all offer, they all have their merits to them. I yeah. think I'm a Crimea main. Okay. With a Norway alt? I don't think I have a main. I think I like jumping. I like the jumping around to different people parts. And I, I like the many different avenues to victory, whether you pursue a strategy that's heavy on buildings or a strategy that's heavy on combat. You can kind of mix and match that way. And yeah, I like Scythe quite a bit. It's one of my favorite games, probably. But this is the game for which we have the most specific recommendation. It's not a broad blanket. No, yeah. You would want to be playing this with someone who realizes they're getting into a two-hour board game with like an extra 15 minutes added on top to explain the rules. Yeah. That will be very thinky, yeah, and the potential to have your plans go awry the few times someone does interfere with you and attacks you. Adaptability. Yeah, Yeah. adaptability is important. Yeah. So that was our review of Scythe. Pick it up at your own risk. It's a lot of fun. Right, but you've you've got to understand the... Someone will enjoy it. Someone will enjoy it. I also reckon it's it's a technically a two to five player game. I think it shines at... Three to five, probably not a very good two to no, player No, no, you're going to want to break out patchwork for that. <laughs> yeah. All right, so another great time we had in this cardboard corner of ours. But you... <laughs> once again, we have to leave. Chris, I've known you for a while. Yeah. And you're not the most imaginative person. 
I don't mean that insultingly, but the length at which we are role playing this corner <laughs> made of cardboard is just so refreshing from my point I- of view. Role play, Heath. This is as real. <laughs> the four walls of this box are as real to me as our friendship. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Let's let's take a walk. I'm gonna be picking packaging peanuts out of my <laughs> pants for weeks. Oh yeah. All right. I'll see you next time. Bye.